Thank you, worship team, for leading us to worship the Lord. Well, I take it that was my pink slip this morning and my days are numbered. <laughs> so, uh, I told you if you'd just stick it out, there'd be better days coming than they are. So. My granddaughter came to me, one of them, and said, Grandpa, are you mad? <laughs> She's asked me several times, and I said, no, honey, I'm not mad. Well, your face. <laughs> and I tried to explain it's my age, and things sag, and the elasticity isn't there anymore. So, honey, I just want you to know I'm not mad, <laughs> although preaching sometimes makes us look mad. But it does sober us, and these are sobering times. I want to talk about arming ourselves for the days that we're in, arming ourselves for what's coming. In 1 Peter 4, if you want to be finding your way there. As you all know, Israel is at war with Hamas. It just is all over the headlines, all over the news. But Hamas is not actually a country. <laughs> it's a terrorist group, which is backed primarily by the country of Iran. Israel has had to fully arm herself and... Uh, put her full military on alert and readiness and call up hundreds of thousands of reservists just to defend herself uh, from destruction by evil forces. Don't listen to the media hype. Don't go with all the demonstrations in our country. I'm ashamed of what's taking place across our country concerning Israel. The son of the co-founder of Hamas said this last week, his name is David Joseph. He said the atrocities in Israel are not Israel's fault. His daddy helped found Hamas. He said Hamas is barbaric. It's, it's satanic. It's evil. And it is. It's really an expression and an, just a, a full thrust of evil against Israel. But our nation also is being invaded. Our state's being invaded from the southern border and a very real threat of a coordinated attack on our soil by terror cells is very real. I don't know how much credibility to give to the head of the FBI. They've kind of become weaponized, I think. That's my opinion. But he said this week this is the absolute highest alert to danger of terrorist attack in the history of our country right now. That's how serious it is for him even to say that. It's because we've just had so many 20 and 30 year olds coming across the border of military age and who knows, I, I suspect, maybe a conf conspiracy theorist, but I suspect that they, they have a network somehow and somebody's gonna trigger and, and their objective is mass civil unrest in our cities because that's where they went. Wouldn't take much. And then we find ourselves uh, in a real serious, serious situation. There is a mounting threat of violence against Christians as well as Jews in America. And so we need to live every day with a constant awareness of physical and spiritual danger around us here. And I, I didn't say to live constantly every day with fear or in fear, but with a conscious awareness of what's around you and who's around you every day. We can't let down our guard in these days. These are dangerous times. And so we have to trust the Lord. In chapter 3 of 1 Peter, the theme of suffering was introduced, as we looked at last time, and we saw suffering exemplified in the person of Jesus Christ. We come now to chapter 4, where Peter is in full-blown preparation mode for his readers to fully prepare themselves, or as Peter says it, arm themselves for suffering for Jesus. It's been said that suffering and pain can't really harm you. Pain is really a friend. It lets you know something's wrong in your body. It can't kill you itself. I don't know which branch, the military, the army, the Marines, one of, one of the branches says that pain is really just weakness leaving your body. Okay. Now, if that's true, I have some questions I want to ask. Like, uh, how much weakness is there in my body that needs to leave before things will be okay? Uh, 
I don't know about you, but I, I don't particularly like pain and suffering. <laughs> I've had my share of it physically. I ripped my leg open when I was a boy, and that, that was a painful experience, and going through illnesses that were not pleasant, and um, emotionally, the, the death of my son just did a number on me, extremely uh, painful suffering experience to go through. Uh, but I'd just soon skip that part of, of the, God's classroom to help me know more about Christ if I could. But, but we're in his classroom, and we can't leave that out because that's the only way we can know, learn some things about our Savior, Jesus, is by going through suffering and pain. I apologize for that, but that's just what Peter's saying here. I mean, it's just, face it, <laughs> we're going to have to go through it. So look with me in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Let's pray. Lord, open our eyes and our understanding to this truth, this, pas this passage and these things that you're speaking to us through your servant, Peter. And Lord, especially in the days that you have us in here at Hamilton, we don't feel so threatened here, but yet we realize that evil can spring up anywhere and that you are our refuge and strength. You're our hiding place. You're our security. So Lord, just uh, equip us for living in these challenging and threatening days. In Christ's name, amen. First, here in 1 Peter 4, suffering is to be expected, Peter's saying. Just expect it. And he keeps lifting up Jesus as the supreme example for us to look to, to know how to face suffering as he's writing these displaced and oppressed readers and as he's speaking to us through them and through his word, addressing the very reality of suffering among us and among them, his readers. A couple of things here. One, Peter exhorts his readers and us to, fa to face suffering uh, triumphantly, victoriously. The word therefore in chapter 4, verse 1, is a summary word. He likes to summarize things every now and then, tie, tie up the loose ends, and so that's what he's doing here. And it points to the triumphant manner in which Christ has suffered for us and died for us, providing us with the proper motivation to do likewise. So it points to the previous chapter 3, chapter 2, and so forth. Therefore, since Christ has suffered, Peter says, has suffered. So it's done and it's over with. It's a fact of history. It's a done deal. He's already done it. In the flesh, this is not the fallen sin nature. There's another word for that in the Greek. This is the physical body. He has suffered in the physical body. Arm yourselves also with the same purpose this speaks of triumph, and it gives the reason here. Because, Peter says, because is a reason word. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. The tense of the verb used here, has suffered is, and has ceased, is perfect tense in the Greek. I don't know exactly how to compare that in, in our English verb, uh, verbs, but the perfect tense in the Greek means this was a specific act that took place in a specific time in the past, and it was so effective and so thorough that it continues even to our day and into the future. That's the perfect tense. So Christ suffered one time in the past. It was so effective that the effectiveness of it continues on even today and into the future. That's the idea that Peter's trying to get across here. So... Uh, what he's saying is that our freedom from sin and bondage to sin is a permanent state for us now who are in Christ. We don't have to carry that baggage around with us. And so our reward, our final state, should be well worth the fight that we fight here. Uh, the phrase arm yourselves in verse 1 is used only here. So way to go, Peter. He grabs another brand new word and puts it to use here in this little letter that he writes Arm yourselves, and refers to a Greek soldier who uh, was preparing himself for entering battle, and he would put on the proper armor to do that. It's exactly what Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, to put on the whole armor of God. 
the belt of truth, the sandals of the preparation of the gospel of peace, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. It's so crucial in these days that we learn those pieces of our, bat our battle armor and put them on every day. Otherwise, you're going to have a vulnerable spot for Satan to hit. So suit up with your armor every day. Peter, Peter says, arm yourselves. All right? And that includes arming your mind as well as your body. Second thing he says here under expecting suffering is that uh, he exhorts his readers and us to fight through suffering for victory. This ought to determine how we live the rest of our lives from today forward. Uh, he says... Uh, so as, in verse 2, to live the rest of the time in the flesh, um, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For the will of God. So we live in spiritually hostile and uh, dangerous territory down here. You say, not in Hamilton. Well, maybe not so much as it would be in a city area, more populous area. But one thing about terrorists, they don't care where they strike. They just like to get the woo and awe and to shock people. And they can do it just as well in a little place as they can in a big place. So we, all of us have to be constantly aware of that. Um, we cannot afford to spend the rest of our lives giving in to our fleshly desires and cravings uh, or to our fears. We need to suit up and face the fight and face the tests and face the battles that come. Secondly here, not only uh, is suffering to be expected, but suffering can be explained as to its cause. Peter does this in verse 3 through verse 6. And he gives three basic reasons for the cause of suffering. Why suffering? He, gives, he tells us here. One, man's depravity. Man's depravity. He points to the past and the expressions of depravity in the past. Look at verse 3. He says that the past is the past, period. Forget it. If we're a believer, it's buried, it's done with. The past is the past. Let the past be the past. Don't keep dwelling on it. Don't go back there. It's, it's done with. For the time already past, Peter says, is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. What's that? Desire of the Gentiles is just another way of saying sin, <laughs> Sin. Kenneth Weist, our Greek scholar, says that everything of the old life is, that is not in accord with the word of God should be taboo in the new life. Uh, the old habits, the old associates, your old relationships, the old practices, your old haunts where you used to visit and do stuff, um, and uh, your old amusements, those sort of things are to be done with. Spend enough time there. All right? And then Peter submits a representative list here, not a comprehensive list, but a representative list which will differ from translation to translation as to the things that depict our depravity. And I use the New American Standard primarily to preach out of, and it says here, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousals, drinking parties, abominable or lawless idolatries, um, King James comes along, and it varies a little bit. It says, when we walked in lasciviousness, that's the course of uh, sensuality. Lasciviousness and sensuality are the, the same. Lusts are the same. Excess of wine, that's drunkenness. Revelings, that's carousals. Banquetings, King James uses, uh, that's uh, drinking parties. And abominable idolatries, that's the same. The word that is translated sensuality or lasciviousness could also be translated lewdness, and I think it should be. It's a stronger word for what he's expressing here. Lewdness describes unbridled, unrestrained sin, an excessive indulgence in sensual pleasure, which today in our world we see manifested in the flaunting of nudity and the uh, preoccupation with illicit sex. You know what America is known for around the world is the primary producer of pornography. We are the primary producer of filth. And that's what the rest of the world knows about us. Didn't used to be that way. But that's where we've gone into all this a, a preoccupation with lewdness. And then lust simply refers to passionate, sinful desires, uh, inordinate desires. 
revelings or carousals, Peter uses here, meant, used to mean village merrymaking. Not much wrong with that, just being happy in town, you know. But um, it came to describe orgies or a band of drunken, wild-acting people staggering through the streets of town wreaking havoc. That's what it came to mean. Antifa? BLM? I don't know. Banquetings comes from a Greek word which refers to drinking bouts. Uh, the word in Greek is potos, P-O-T-O-S, not potos. That's an acronym for President of the United States. We don't want to get them confused. Uh, parties that were held in conjunction to pagan religious rites, potos, banquetings. I don't know if it's, those of you who are out of school and way past school remember high school days. <laughs> I remember my high school days. Um, and what was kind of typical is that guys would find a way to get some booze and go off on a weekend, get drunk or drink, have a drinking party, you know. Uh, they'd get somebody who had, was legal age could get it for them. And that's what went on in Hamilton, I know. Went on in where I finished high school at. And somehow, by God's grace, I was, I was spared that, kept out of that. I didn't participate in those, those events, those things. But I had a dear friend, and I don't know why except just God's grace, because I had my first drink when I was five years of age. I wish I could say I'm a recabite. I've never touched this stuff, but I'm not. I have. But when I was five, uh, our family was visiting my aunt and uncle in Stephenville, and he had to have his little nightcap, you know, his little toddy. And he thought it would be cute if he gave me one to see my response. And I didn't know anybody. I was just a dumb five-year-old, and he gave me a um, shot glass full of whiskey, and, and they said, drink it. So I downed it, and my throat burst into flames, and I didn't know what was happening. I screamed and hollered. And what made it really painful and, and bad was that he laughed at me. But you know, God used that in my life to say, I don't, I don't need that stuff. There's no, nothing fun in that especially to be made fun of. And then it was just all around me growing up. My dad drank, drank for a while uh, and realized as my brother and I got older that this was not for his sons, and praise God, he, he forsook that. But when I was in high school, I was a senior in high school in Grand Saline, where I finished high school, and uh, a dear friend of mine, Johnny Walker, great big six foot six, six foot seven young man, great basketball player, had a tremendous future in sports, and uh, felt a call to ministry to preach, and had been preaching some, and he was kind of back and forth. He was on fire for the Lord one day, and the next day he would be concerned about his old buddies and go back and back and forth. And one night, Johnny and a friend were in the back of a pickup, and they were driving through town, and those in the front were driving, and there was some alcohol involved, and they turned, took a corner too quick, and it, Johnny lost his balance being such a tall boy, and he went over the back end of the pickup, and the first thing to hit was his head on the back bumper, crushed his skull, and Johnny was dead, just like that. No more preaching for that young man. No more athletics. Just gone. That tremendously affected me. What, just for a little thrill and some laughs? It's not worth it. And I could spend the rest of the morning telling you episode after episode how it's damaged my family and uh, people that I love. How when we were at the hospitality house, we had people every weekend coming to visit a loved one in prison who had taken a drink, driven, and somebody got killed, and so they were convicted of manslaughter. And just the grief it brings to families. I know the gun doesn't kill, the person does. I know the drink, the booze doesn't kill, it's the heart. But Peter's saying, what's past is past, let it be done, leave the stuff alone. Don't, don't keep up the carousings and the drinking parties and all of that. That's not for us in these last days. That's our depravity. Um, another thing here is man's distortions. Look at verse 4, how lost people... Uh, the unsaved, it says, are shocked, <laughs> shocked. The word is strange, xenos in the Greek, something totally foreign to them, and they're thinking that we Christians don't want to party with them. I can't tell you how many times because I would say, no, thank you, I, I'm not interested, I don't want to go there, I don't want to drink, I don't want to get into that. 
how many times I got scoffed and laughed at and how they were shocked that I didn't want to have fun with them. But I don't regret it. And they don't realize what a grip sin and evil and lack of self-control and all that has on them and how the power has been broken in the believer's life. And they know freedom in Christ. And so they don't know any better than it says here to, to, than to malign you or bad mouth you because you don't participate in their parties. Man's doom is a third thing that uh, can be explained, uh, how suffering can be explained. Verse 5, Peter warns that their day is coming. Those who are shocked that you don't participate in their sin, their day is coming. He says, but they shall give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. King James says the quick and the dead. If you're dead, you ain't very quick, okay? That means alive or living. Uh, the pronoun they or who refers not to us, but to the Gentile unbelievers. It says they have to give an account. They have to, what it, that means, they have to pay back. They have to pay back. There's a payback. <laughs> Dr. R.G. Lee preached his famous sermon, There's Payday Sunday. All of us have to face payday where we have to pay back. Those who malign and badmouth us don't get away with it. That's, that's a truth in Scripture. They don't get away with it. This refers to unsaved people, dead or alive, who have pursued the course of depravity and uh, that was mentioned above, and who malign and make fun of believers, followers of Jesus, they must stand before Jesus at the great white throne judgment as Revelation 20 talks about. They have to give an account for their sinful lifestyle and the way they have wasted their lives in frivolity and, and uh, excess. And uh, They have to face judgment. The Bible tells us all the way through that the wicked don't get away with it. They don't get away with it. Payday comes. <laughs> they have to pay back. Without Christ, they face certain doom. That should grieve us. And that should cause us to have a burden for them, especially if we know them. The word for judge used here in verses 5 and 6 means to judge, to decide, to condemn, it has a uh, wide spectrum of meanings. It also has within it this idea of if there's a decision or a judgment made, a verdict given, that it also contains the proper penalty for that wrong done, to judge. For the gospel, verse 6 says, has for this purpose been preached. The word is evangelizo in the Greek. It means uh, to preach the gospel, a joyful message. It's not the word that just simply means to make an announcement. Even to those who are dead. The gospel for this purpose has been preached even to those who are dead. Whoa, Peter. How can you preach to the dead? Well, some Sundays it's not hard. To, it's not a stretch. To, <laughs> but he said last Sunday, you know, now, baptism now saves you. And we had to, wait a minute. And they had to go back and see what Peter meant. And he explained it. That it's really a pledge to God to live in obedience to him. But how do you... Possibly what Peter had in mind with this is that those who had heard the gospel, accepted the gospel of Christ while they were alive and they had since died, uh, perhaps having been martyred because many were martyred for their faith back then. By the time Peter wrote this letter, these were already dead. And he's preaching the, the gospel message in this letter and they didn't get to read it. Uh, they'd already been judged in the flesh as men and that could mean that they had been judged uh, as uh, by the wicked, judging, uh, maligning and judging them for their uh, abstaining from sin and drunkenness and all of that. Or it could mean that um, they, they had already been judged, uh, their sins had been judged by Christ and they had accepted Christ and their sins were covered and so judgment was taken care of for them. And so Peter says, they may live in the spirit not in the flesh, they're dead, according to the will of God. The Bible says he who has died is what? Freed from sin. When you die, you're done with sin. It's all over. And so these folks had already died, already apparently had believed in the Lord, and so they can live triumphantly the rest of their eternal life 
and remain forever in God's will. A third thing here is that suffering can equip us for living in the last days. Living in the last days. Look at verse 7 with me. I want to read these verses 7 through 11. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be, joy, be, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Verse 9, be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks, let him speak as it were the utterances of God. Whoever serves, let him do so as by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter even uses an amen here. Was he praying? It was kind of offered like a prayer. But uh, in this section, Peter informs his readers that the end of all things is at hand. It is near. That was 2,000 years ago. He thought it was imminent. It's going to happen like then. I and mean, we're 2,000 years down the road from Peter. Did he miss it? The Bible says to God, one day is as a 1,000 years. A thousand years is as a day. With God, time is measured differently. So a day is a thousand years, and it's been 2,000 years. That's only a couple of days in God's scheme of things. And he proceeds to give his readers and to us some ways in which suffering can better equip us when the final end does come. The Greek word for end here is not a chronological term as to seconds, minutes, and hours. There's two different words for time in the Greek, and this is uh, kairos, which is more uh, the idea of the completion, the consummation of a season, an age, a period. Um, it's a result attained, a realization. That's the idea of the end, uh, completion of all things is, is, is at hand. And the word at hand simply means it's, it can be any moment you know, these believers back then in Peter's day who were reading this really and truly believed that Jesus' imminent, immediate, quick return was just around the corner. They really believed that. And that's the way we are supposed to live every day. And he pleads with them and us, therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of what? Of prayer. King James says, watch unto prayer. In other words, be serious-minded, be watchful, stay alert. So uh, one thing that suffering can equip us in is to make us more prayerful. As we see the real end coming, folks, we are very close, much closer than Peter was. When you see all this happening in Israel, the Bible says pay attention. Pay attention. Serious, serious stuff. We're on the verge of the last prophecy that needs to be fulfilled, he could come at any moment. Two, suffering should equip us and make us more practical. Look at verse 8. He begins verse 8 with the words, above all or above all things. Well, what's all things? That's all things. <laughs> no exceptions, nothing excluded. All things. Above all makes it a high priority. If it's above all and everything else, means it's at the top of the list. It's number one. Everything else is secondary. Make this your number one priority, Peter says. Keep fervent. If you keep fervent, that means you've already started being fervent. Don't quit. Keep it up. In your love for one another, keep fervent. You know, when we're swimming in a society that is saturated with hatred and bigotry, we truly have to work at loving one another, don't we? We have to work at loving one another with this kind of heartfelt intensity. Because it's so easy to become bitter and cold and callous and uh, cynical because of all that's happening around us. Now, the word for fervent here means to be stretched literally out of your comfort zone. Allow the Lord to stretch you out of your comfort zone in these last days. And he gives a good reason for why we should as he quotes from Proverbs 10:12 here in 1 Peter 4 as he says, 
Be, uh, because love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. We must always be ready to overlook the offenses against us and to be quick to forgive others, their insults, their unkind treatment. Peter said to Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? It must have been Andrew. And Jesus said 70 times 7. 490 times a day if you have to forgive, 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 forgive. In verse 9, he gives us another practical use of suffering. He says, be hospitable to one another without complaint or grudging. The word hospitality in the Greek means literally uh, to be friendly to strangers. Be friendly to strangers, especially in that day, it meant to take care of the needs of traveling Christians because it was so horrifically dangerous to travel the roads in that day. Hmm. Uh, we were in Fort Worth this week. And you know, they don't need to worry about terrorists. They're on their roads. <laughs> we were just glad to get back home safe. All right? But there was a lot of danger in that day, and so the Christians that did travel, they needed to have a safe place to go, a safe home. Also, it was kind of dangerous to hold church services in that day, so they opened up the door, their home, to church in their home because it was safer. So it has to do with opening up our home and ministering to the needs of other believers. And uh, when we were pastoring in Tennessee, I had a dear couple in our church, the Sandlins. His name was Lou Don, Lou Don, unusual name, and her name was June. He was the chairman of our deacons and just a gracious couple. He was a poster child for the southern gentleman, just a tremendous guy. And you never set your feet under a table with better food than June could fix, just good old southern cooking. And they built and added a, a room onto their house. They lived way back in the holler. I don't know what that is. In the sticks. And uh, had a creek running through their place, so peaceful. They built a room on their home so they could put up visiting preachers or missionaries. Hospitality. Uh, they got an A-plus in hospitality, taking care of God's servants. Um, that's what Peter says here. Be hospitable to one another. Verses 10 and 11 encourages the practical exercise of your spiritual gift. He gets into spiritual gifts here in meeting the needs of suffering saints, which is really just the expression of fervent love back in verse 8. So he says here, as each one has received a special gift singular gift, employ it, use it, that gift, in serving one another as good stewards. We're all to be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. All right, I'm in verse 10. This says that you already have a spiritual gift. Every one of you have been born in, again in Christ. So use it and meet needs with it. Learn your gift. Peter indicates there's two categories, general categories for spiritual gifts. He simplifies it. Corinthians says there's seven, there's nine, there's 12, there's different lists. Peter says there's just two categories. Uh, he says, whoever speaks, the gift of speaking. If you have the ability to get up and put words together and make a sentence and make sense, you can teach a class, preach a sermon, you can do music because music involves words and speaking. Uh, you can do counseling. You have the gift of speaking. That's a spiritual gift. One category. The other category, uh, whoever serves. Uh, so the gift of serving, which is meeting needs, uh, doing practical ministry. So Peter says, you've got a gift. It's either using your tongue or using your hands. Go for it. Use it for his glory. The word steward is the word that means a state manager or someone who's been entrusted with another person's resources and is held accountable for what he does with it until that person comes back and claims it. We're all to be good stewards. As Christians, I hate to tell you this this morning, but we don't actually own anything. <laughs> I hate to break that to you, but none of us really owns anything. It's all his. And the last casket I saw at the last funeral was just a body in there. It wasn't all their possessions. Sometimes they leave a ring or a picture in there or something. God, I hate to tell you this, that doesn't go with their spirit. It stays in there. We don't carry anything with us. Um, we're just stewards and managers of what God entrusts to us. So tithing helps. That's not a cuss word, okay? 
It really helps. God says it's all mine, but I'm I'm loaning you, uh, loaning it to you. You get to live off of ninety percent of what I entrust to you. I just ask you to keep giving me ten percent, ten percent, ten percent, just to keep reminding you that all of it's really mine. <laughs> Suffering may sober us in this, cause us to realize even more sharply how much really does belong to God and how little belongs to us. If you lost a loved one, you understand that and appreciate that. So there's a third thing here. Um, suffering equips us to make us more perceptive, verse 11. And Peter makes it very plain in verse 11 about the exercise of these, these gifts, speaking gifts or serving gifts, and that God is to get all the glory, he says. Whatever your gift is, use it, meet needs, but give God the glory. And he says, amen. Even Peter asked for an amen, so I shouldn't feel bad asking for an amen. Does God get all the glory? Amen. <laughs> he does. So as we begin, we must properly be armed for these days and, and to defend ourselves and our loved ones for uh, these times in which we live. But we need to learn to and be prepared and have a plan to face suffering uh, and to properly and practically use our suffering to become more prayerful and more fervent in our love for one another and more hospitable to strangers or other Christians who have a need or open our homes up to fellow believers to come in and be better stewards of our gifts and of God's manifold grace, as it says there. Examine your stewardship this morning. What has God put in your hands? What has God entrusted to you to take care of? Or who has he put into your hands to take care of? How are you doing? How are you managing that and using it for his glory? Will you be like the servant that his master put some talents in his hand and he went away and when he came back, that servant had used his investment and doubled it? Or will you be like the servant his master gave him a talent uh, an investment went away, came back, and the servant had buried it, and he had to hang his head in shame because he didn't use what was entrusted to him. God is coming back. The Lord is coming back. We will have to give an account for how we've used what he's put in our hands, Peter says. Will you be ready when the time comes for you to suffer for your faith in Jesus? Well, that's a tough question. I don't like the question because we really don't know, do we? We don't know what we're going to be faced with. Let me tell you what's going on right now in this day in our world, in our nation, especially over in Israel, and atrocities, horrific, gruesome, barbaric practices, and it all has to do with faith. Here in America, it's the stealing of little ones, little girls and others that carried into sex slavery. Suppose the terrorists do hit somewhere close to us. And so they confront you and they say, deny your faith in God and Jesus. You say, no. And they bring your loved one before you. Deny your faith in Jesus. No. And then you hear them screaming, those you love. That's not very far-fetched, folks. That's happening in our day. What will we say? Arm yourselves. We men who are devoted to Christ and under his command must determine to do all we can within our power and our love to protect those we love, even to the denial and uh, neglect or disregard of ourselves. That's tough. Resolve to be more prayerful, more practical, more perceptive of what's going on around you. You parents who have little ones, work at teaching them to be alert and attentive to the world around them and what's happening around them. Be vigilant. Teach them to recognize the signs of threats and dangers and what to do, how to respond, where to run. Is that too far-fetched for our day? When an abduction can happen in a split second? 
We're not to live in fear, but we're to. The Bible says the prudent person sees danger coming and hides himself. Be prudent. Be prepared. Know, know, recognize the signs and the threats. As you go to shop, as you go to town, as you go come to church, be aware of what's happening around you and who is around you all the time. We can't let down our guard. Peter says, arm yourselves. For these days, suffering is a very real thing. Now, let me close with this. God has promised that in the hour that you need him, in the crisis that you are in, he has promised that he will be there for you. He will not forsake you. And you can put your trust in him and not live in fear. Because he is able to keep that which is committed to him until the coming of the day. Father, thank you for your sobering words to us through Peter. Father, how is it that we seem to find ourselves in a very similar day and situation as those saints, those believers in Peter's day? We look forward to the day when we are done with sin and evil and wickedness forever. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, and keep us and our loved ones and those precious little ones safe in these days until your coming. Amen. Let's stand.